Welcome to this session on Eucharistic Theology on the morning of Maundy Thursday. Last Sunday we looked at what I call the macro, the large. We looked at buildings. Now I'm trying to encourage you to think about what buildings say to us and what their theology is. This morning I'm taking exactly the same approach but going to the opposite end. Rather than looking at large things, today we're going to be looking at small things. We're going to be looking at a table, at a chalice, at bread and wine, candles and liturgical actions. What people do with their hands, what they do with their bodies, what do they do when they are at the table, what do they do when they are behind the table, what do they do when they are around the table. You may be wondering where I am. I'm at home in my dining room. How can you tell it's a dining room? It's a dining room because it's got a dining room table. Only half of it. Do you recognise the shape? It's like the table in the church of St Ignatia of Loyola. I have taken half my dining room table, which means that there's a flat bit at the back here and there is a curved bit. Because I think this says something about what we're trying to explore and express this morning. The idea that we are gathered around the table. And to make it easier, there's a flat bit at this side, so quite frankly, it's easy for me to get to things and to pick things up. So you can tell it's a dining room because it has a table. You might think this is rather flippant, but you can also tell it's a dining room because it's got a wooden floor. It's not carpeted. Dining rooms and refectories are functional places. Dining rooms and refectories and restaurants are places where food and drink are eaten and enjoyed and also places where food and drink are spilt. And so most dining rooms, refectories and restaurants don't have carpets, they have some kind of wooden floor. The one thing that makes it different from an ordinary dining room is that I've taken the chairs out. When I'm presiding at the Eucharist and I'm at the table, from that moment on at the table I always stand. There is no need to sit down and therefore there are no chairs. So in a sense this illustrates the first question we might ask about the Eucharist and about sacramental theology. If you were doing this in your home, which room would you choose? Would you choose the dining room or the dining space if your house is not that large? Or would you choose the lounge or the sitting room? Or would you choose the kitchen, which is behind me? Or if you have enough space, would you choose the study? It wouldn't occur to you, would it, to use either the bedroom or the garage? Though perhaps you might decide to use outside. In other words, using the dining room or the dining space says something about this being a meal. And if you just reflect for a moment about those concepts of those different spaces, think back to your own churches or the churches that you've been on placement this year. The place in which people share the bread and wine, in that church, does it feel more like a dining room? Or a lounge? Or a sitting room? Or a coffee shop? What type of furniture does it have? Does it have the furniture that goes with a dining room, a refectory and a restaurant? Or does it have the kind of furniture that you'd associate with a lounge, or a dining room, or a coffee area. What does it feel like? Or does it feel very impersonal and distant, so that it, it may as easily have been outside? So the actual liturgical space in which we set our table, and in which we gather together to share bread and wine, actually makes a difference. As we discovered on Sunday, the actual shape and feel that the whole building makes a difference? Does the whole building make it feel like an intimate gathering of the people of God? Or does the whole building, a bit like Coventry Cathedral, make it feel like the human beings are tiny, tiny little actors on a huge scale and a huge stage, and that's what the building is designed to remind us of, that we are here and God is up there. But as I intimated on Sunday, I believe that's a kind of hierarchical and also a kind of Book of Common Prayer theology. It comes out of theology when we believe that there's something down here that we called hell 
There was something here that we called the world, and there was something up there that we called heaven. But if we believe as Christians that we are in Christ, and if we believe in the incarnation, and believe therefore that things matter, and that the stuff of things matter, then surely the Eucharist is something about gathering around the table, as opposed to certain people gathering this side of the table, and other people gathering that side of the table. Now obviously, because of the buildings that we've inherited, some of them don't lend themselves to gathering around the table, but there are some things we can think of. In some of the posts that came after Sunday, at least one person said, isn't this all though a waste of expense? Isn't it very expensive to change buildings that we've had for decades and even perhaps hundreds of years into places that are more conducive for worship in the 21st century. Couldn't that money be spent better elsewhere? Well, I have two answers to that question, really. The first is opportunity. I go into lots of churches, both in this diocese and in other dioceses, which are extremely well cared for. It's quite clear that over a long period of time, an awful lot of money has been spent keeping that building dry, and warm, clean, well-lit, good sound systems, and in some places really incredible works of art, and a lot of money has been poured into that building. Perhaps there are new facilities, perhaps there's a new kitchen, perhaps there are new toilets, perhaps the disability access has been taken seriously, and it's easy to get into the building, and it's easy to go to the toilet or the kitchen, because these things are important. In the process of spending all that money, if the church has never ever at the same time thought about the liturgical space in which they're operating, then that begs some questions. In other words, if there is money to be spent on the building, where is that money going to be spent? All the things I've just mentioned are very important, but this is also important, gathering around the table. And secondly, Sometimes there are very small changes that you can make into a building that don't even cost a penny. There are lots of churches nowadays, sadly, where following that pattern that I described on Sunday, where you come in the back of the church, you walk down the nave, you get to the chancel step, then you get to the choir stalls, and then you get to the communion mail, and then you get to the sanctuary and the table. Sadly, nowadays, in a lot of those churches, there's nobody in the choir. The choir stalls are empty. And it means now that when the president, when he or she stands behind the table at the East End and looks down the building towards the people, there is a big gap. A gap where the choir used to be. And to be fair, when those churches are full and when the choir stalls are full, there's a sense in which those buildings still work. But when the choir stalls are empty, it feels really odd when trying to gather around the table that there is this big space between the person who is presiding and the people who are not only 20 or 30 yards away but even down four or five steps. So what can you do? Well the simplest thing of course is you could quite simply move the table or get a smaller table and place the table at, an at a usual space, a space that can be found or created just where the front pews are. And that can sometimes be relatively inexpensive. In some churches, it's completely cost-free. But then see what happens. Do the congregation like it? Or do the congregation hate it? In other words, would the congregation rather still keep all the liturgical action, all the holy things at a distance? Or do they relish the opportunity to gather around the table because now they are closer to where the action is, where things are going to take place. And what about children? A few years ago, one Christmas, I was looking at one of our friend's two-year-old child, and we spent a bit of time in our own church, in our own village here. I was in the congregation, just in the, the side aisle, watching what was happening, and at the same time, keeping the child engaged. What I became very aware of, as I knelt on the floor with her in this side aisle, was that not only was the table where the action was taking place very distant 
but because of the corner and me looking from the side out, I couldn't even see that table. I wonder at our puzzlement that sometimes children don't seem to be excited by what we do in church when one of the things that's going on is that the children cannot see. If I had some children here now to share with me in standing around the table, would I put them somewhere down the other end of my lounge, about, you know, 10 yards away? Or would I come and ask them to stand next to me? Would I ask them to stand there? Would I ask them to stand there so that we were gathered around the table of the king? So yes, changes to buildings can be costly, but on the other hand, sometimes there are some simple things that we can do in order to experience more the idea of gathering around the table. But before we go any further, first of all, some books. I've mentioned some of these in my feedback on the forums that we posted on Sunday. And the first one I want to mention is this book by Sarah Miles. Some of you may have been wondered, and indeed Christians have wondered over many years, about the value of a Eucharist, which appears to be culturally so different to what is going on in the wider church. And yet the story of Sarah Miles, and some of you will know the story well, is that she simply wandered into a church one day, and somebody placed bread into her hands. And the way she describes it at that moment, she says, Jesus simply entered both my body and my life. In other words, that the actual sharing of bread and wine can be an evangelistic and a conversion experience. And then secondly, this book by David Holton, Our Thanks and Praise. It's got a very boring and complicated title, The Eucharist in Anglicanism Today, Papers from the Fifth International Anglican Liturgical Consultation. I told you it had a long title. But the point about this, this is not a Church of England book. It's an Anglican book. This gathers together papers about what Anglicans think throughout the whole world and throughout the Anglican communion. As teachers and tutors, we constantly remind you that the Church of England is not the Anglican communion. The Church of England is not even the Anglican Church. The Church in England, the Church of England, is a small part of the Anglican communion. Because in these sessions we're, we're dealing with the basics of the Eucharist and the basics of liturgy, then even though this book by Michael Perry, Pastoral Liturgy, is still quite old, it came out in 2000 now when Common Worship came out, almost everything that I would say about the basics of the Eucharist you would find in that book. And if it's out of print, you can probably get a good copy quite easily second hand. So, some books. I want to turn now to Don Gregory Dix. This is my copy of his book, The Shape of the Liturgy. As you can see, it's a little tatty. I've had this since I was a student at Ordination College. According to the inside page, it was first published in 1945, a second edition in 1945, and then it gets reprinted about six or seven times. So Don Gregory Dix was an Anglican monastic who lived in this country and this book the shape of the liturgy it is fair to say I think has had more effect on liturgical revision in the 1960s 70s and 80s in the Anglican communion and indeed in other denominations in the Free Church and the Roman Catholic Church than possibly any other book so again if you want something to dip into to pick up to where all our historical roots are about liturgy you can do no worse than to read Don Gregory Dix. It will definitely be in any decent library and you can certainly pick up second-hand copies. I've got in front of me now a copy of the Book of Common Prayer, a copy of the Alternative Service Book and a copy of Common Worship. I want in a couple of minutes to try and sketch out exactly what it was that Don Gregory Dix is trying to get to in that like 500, 600 page book. Don Gregory Dix was a person who grew up with the Book of Common Prayer. That was his theology and that was his liturgy. But like many 
lit liturgists and historians, he was studying both the early church and the development of the early church and how Eucharistic prayers and how the Eucharist developed over several centuries. And to, to reduce his rather large tome into a few sentences, what he discovered was this, that essentially at the heart of the Eucharist, there are what we call four dominical acts. Dominical means Lord. So these four acts are something that Jesus did. And for Don Gregory Dix, the four dominical acts are that Jesus takes some bread, he gives thanks for that bread, he breaks that bread, and he distributes it. Where does that come from? Don Gregory Dix sees those actions as the essential elements in the early Eucharistic prayers. And then by the time he gets the Book of Common Prayer, Don Gregory Dix sees uh, Cranmer kind of mixing up and hiding and confusing those actions. So to repeat, he says the four actions are simply that Jesus takes bread, he gives thanks for the bread, he breaks the bread, and he distributes the bread. If you want some biblical precedence for this, then go to the New Testament and look at the feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000, both in the um, Synoptic Gospels and also in St. John's Gospel. And if you notice also that when Paul is on the ship on the way to Rome, he does exactly the same thing. He takes some bread, he gives thanks for it, he breaks it and he distributes it. Some of you know I'm fond of red herring, so here's a kind of liturgical red herring straight away. It's all in the detail, liturgists we always say. Jesus takes the bread, he gives thanks for it, he breaks it and he distributes it. But in actual fact, if you go back to the stories of the feeding of the four or five thousand, Jesus' distribution is to give the bread to the disciples. It's the disciples who distribute the bread and the wine. Why is that important? What it says for me is that the distribution of bread and wine is not a priestly action. The distribution of bread and wine is something that can by, be done by any member of our Eucharistic community. In other words, it can be done by any lay person. It's interesting that it wasn't until the middle of the 1990s when the House of Bishops was doing some work on what it meant to preside at the Eucharist, but that for the first time in the 1990s, the House of Bishops actually recorded that in terms of the way they understood the theology of the Eucharist, any lay person who had been given by a license by the bishop to distribute wine could do two other things. They could also take bread and wine to those who were sick at home, and they could also distribute the bread in church on a Sunday morning. So I have to ask you a question. How many times in a church that you've been, your home church or in placement, and I'm thinking particularly of smaller churches here, perhaps a church of only 25 or 35 people. How often in that celebration have you seen the person who is presiding when they get to the distribution of the community give the bread and wine to somebody else and simply go and sit down and pray while the bread and wine is distributed because the distribution of the bread and wine is not a priestly act. But what tends to happen, and again this is part of my theory about us having a book of common prayer community memory, we tend to do it the way we've always done it. So on a small celebration, the priest, he or she, with up perhaps 10 or 25 or 30 people, will do almost everything that is required in the service. He or she will actually take the bread, give thanks and break it, and she or he will distribute it, sometimes even the bread and the wine, and yet when we go back to the scriptures, the distribution of the bread and wine is not a priestly function. So I, I, obviously I'm going to keep saying this in the next 10 minutes, the fourfold action, the four dominical acts that Don Gregory Dix identified are the taking, the giving thanks, the breaking and the distributing. I've got before me here a copy of the Book of Common Prayer, and I'm going to put it a bit closer to the camera. 
This is the book that Don Gregory Dix was brought up on. And I want to draw your attention to this bit here. It reads like this. Here, the priest may take the pattern into his hands. It had to be a he, of course. And then B, and here, to break the bread. And C, here, to lay his hand upon the bread. And then D, here, he is to take the cup into his hand. And E, and here, to lay his hand upon every vessel, be it chalice or flagon, in which there is any wine to be consecrated. And you have probably seen this many times, especially when there's more than one chalice or more than one pattern on a table. You see the priest doing with this, with he or she doing this and this with each of their hands because it comes from a book of common prayer theology when all those things happened inside the Eucharistic prayer. But look what happens when we get to the alternative service book, which is 1980. This is the alternative service book. And notice what it says here. The taking of the bread and cup and the giving of thanks. And the rubric reads, bearing in mind 1980, once again this is before the ordination of women. The president takes the bread and the cup into his hands and replaces them on the holy table. If I borrow a chalice and a pattern for a moment. The president takes the bread and the cup into his hands and replaces them on the holy table. And then it continues, the Lord be with you, lift up your hearts, etc, etc. In other words, in other words, what happened during liturgical revivals of the 1960s, 70s and 80s ecumenically, was a rediscovery of the understanding of the fourfold action, the four shapes, the four dominical acts that Don Gregory Dix had identified in the early liturgies. And so in the 1970s and 80s, in our country starting with series three and then with the ASB in 1980, came an attempt to make it very clear that the taking was not something that happened during the Eucharistic prayer. That the taking is something that has to happen before the Eucharistic prayer. Now it's easy to get the taking confused with the tradition in many churches where there is an offertory procession and the bread and wine is brought to the table. That's the important verb and action there. It's brought to the table by lay people and it's brought as part of our offering and sometimes as part of our offering we also bring some money as well. But the most important thing we're offering is the bread and wine, and that bread and wine is both the fruit and the symbol of our labours. Because somebody has to grow the wheat, somebody has to bake the bread, somebody has to grow the vine, somebody has to make the wine. So the bread and the wine, as well as eventually being for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, when they are brought to the table, they are symbols of our life. They are symbols of our life's worth, and they are symbols of our life's work. And then to go back to the ASB again, if I turn on a few pages, after the Eucharistic prayer, it says this. The Lord's Prayer is said either as follows or its traditional form. Then after the Lord's Prayer come some words which we are probably so familiar with nowadays, we don't realise how different this is from the Book of Common Prayer. And so after the Lord's Prayer, the president says, and the rubric reads, the president breaks the consecrated bread, saying, we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. And that breaking of the bread we call the fraction. So it's very clear in the Book of Common Prayer that the, the taking of the bread, the breaking of the bread, the taking of the wine, the blessing of all the vessels that have wine in them, all those actions take place within the Eucharistic prayer. 
By the time you get to the alternative service book, following Don Gregory Murray's fourfold action of taking, giving thanks, breaking and distributing, then the president, he or she, takes the bread and wine into his or her hands and places them back on the table for all to see. That's the important thing. And then the Eucharistic prayer takes place, starting either with the Lord is here or the Lord be with you. When the Eucharistic prayer is finished, the president and the people pray together the Lord's prayer. And then when the Lord's prayer has been finished, then the president, on behalf of the people, takes the bread and breaks the bread. The next thing that happen is using these or other words, the president will invite people to come and receive communion. So for example, draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then perhaps the president will give the bread and wine to somebody else and other people will then distribute that bread and wine. Better still, in order to try and get away as far as possible from this sense of hierarchy, because remember, the president is presiding on a celebration of the people. Even better, if those who are distributing the bread and wine simply come to the table, pick up the bread and the wine and take it to wherever they are distributing it, and perhaps the president, he or she, goes somewhere and sits down. And then eventually, the president will receive communion. I'll come to that later. So that's the Alternative Service Book, 1980. I can't stress how radical is the change between the Book of Common Prayer and the Alternative Service Book. If I go one step back to the Book of Common Prayer, I cannot stress how radical the Book of Common Prayer was to what came before it. Because the Book of Common Prayer was about making worship be something that the public could do, that people could do. That worship was not something that happened in a secret place, behind a secret screen, using special words that nobody understood. The Book of Common Prayer was making worship literally the worship of the people. So the Book of Common Prayer is radical and it's revolutionary. The ASB is also radical and revolutionary because now the theology of the people of God celebrating liturgy comes into play. And therefore the difference between the Alternative Service Book and the Book of Common Prayer isn't just about words, it's about theology. Which brings us to common worship. In the Common Worship main volume, I'm looking at page 175, so that you can look it up yourself if you want to have a look later. And I'm looking at these rubrics here in red. In another session, we could talk about the shape of the Eucharist, and that's not for today, except that to note that the second half of the Eucharist, the Eucharist being in two parts, liturgy of the Word and liturgy of the Sacrament, the second part of the Eucharist, the liturgy of the Sacrament, starts with the peace, as on that page. And so the peace happens, and then under the peace it says, preparation of the table and taking of the bread and wine. And it says, a hymn may be sung. The gifts of the people may be gathered and presented. The table is prepared and bread and wine are placed upon it. One or more of the prayers at the preparation of the table may be said. The president takes the bread and the wine. Now, in parentheses here, another little red herring. What's implicit both in the Alternative Service Book and in Common Worship in the preparation of the table and the placing of bread and wine on it, what is implied there is that the table is empty. Apart from possibly from the Book of Common Prayer, fair linen cloth, nothing should be on the table. And I'm not going to speak about it today, but what that means is that for Anglicans in the Church of England, the arrival of the Alternative Service Book should have seen the death of the burst and veil. If you don't know what a burst and veil is, don't ask me, you're blessed and you don't need to know. But the burst and veil was basically invented in order to transport and protect the Eucharist, the elements of the Eucharist, the chalice and the pattern, etc., when they're taken from one place to another. 
But in the alternative service book, it's quite clear. The table is prepared. In common worship, the table is prepared. So logically, there's no need for a verse and veil. So if we pause there and just remind ourselves, in common worship, it's quite clear that it's following the traditions and the pattern and the theology that was first explored by the Church of England in 1980, the Untaught Service Book, which is to follow Don Gregory Dix's fourfold action. And therefore, the fourfold action is the taking of the bread, the giving thanks, the breaking and the distributing. What I want to talk about now is actually what happens at the table. First thing I'm going to do is take a candle. I'm going to place the candle there. You might ask me why, why have I not got two candles? Does a, a table or an altar, if that's your tradition, doesn't a table traditionally have two candles, one on the left and one on the right? I've been sometimes in sessions like this or in the, uh, in the bar or the coffee shop at All Saints where someone tries to drag me into a horrendously detailed conversation about how important it is that you light one candle before the other when you're getting ready for church on Sunday and quite frankly I'm not interested. I think I know the rules but I'm not interested because I've only got one candle. Why have I only got one candle? Well, what is the purpose of the candle? Just let that sink in. What is the purpose of a candle at the table in a Eucharistic celebration? It's not about representing the light of Christ, because that candle could be anywhere in the building. Historically and traditionally, the lighting of a candle at the table is in order to provide light in order to read by. So that when I put my book down, my book is being illuminated by the candle. If I was left-handed, perhaps I might prefer to have my book on the other side, like that. It's interesting how rarely you see that in Anglican churches. There is a prejudice here between those, those of us who are left-handed and those of us who are right-handed. And so nearly every church I go to, the book is usually on the left. There's usually the candles both on the right and on the left. And then interestingly, when we come to distribute communion, we start from the left and go to the right. And if somebody comes along to start from the right to the left, chaos ensues because that's not what we normally do. But the whole thing is actually dominated both by right-handed people and the way in which we read text across the page. So the purpose of the candle is to illuminate the text. It does another thing as well. If I take a second candle, I haven't got one to hand. If I take a second candle and put it there, what I've done is to emphasise a line here which says I'm behind this line and you're in front of that line. So if I just put two candles there, the candles form a line and you have to be one side of the line. At best, you can be on the line, but you still have to be on this side or you have to be on that side. But if there's only one candle, And the one candle doesn't have a front or a back. You can be on any side of that candle because we are gathered around the table. So that's why I often only have one candle. Or if I'm feeling deeply doctrinal and holy, I might have three gathered in a little cluster because it's a symbol and remembrance of the Trinity. But the primary function of the candle is actually to illuminate my book or my script, and so you put it near the candle. If you've ever had the delight of um, reading in church, for example, in the dark, say a carol service, or perhaps like the vigil service that we're going to do on Saturday, you'll suddenly discover the importance of candlelight. It's a very dark church, you've been asked to read the third reading of the carol service, you go to wherever the, the readings be read from, and when you get there, you can't see anything. What you need is a candle, 
in order to be able to read what it is you're being asked to read. So the primary function of a candle here is to give illumination for the script. So in some churches, there won't be a candle on the table at all. And that's absolutely fine because they're not important. They're simply doing a job of illumination. So we're at what we call the offertory in the Eucharist and we are preparing the table. The table is bare. It might have a candle on it. The first thing that goes on the table is the corporal. This is mine. Notice what happens when I put it down. If it's been ironed correctly, it means I can open it up like that, and like that, and like that, and there it is. What's the function of the corporal? Like many things, we often invest them with meaning. Some priests have been trained in both practice and theology to regard the corporal as the place of intention so that anything that's placed within this area is what is to become the bread for us and the body and wine of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's one kind of interpretation. But at a practical level, it's there to catch the crumbs when we do the fraction, which means that after the celebration, you can do this. Fold it up like that, take it away, and then perhaps those crumbs are reverently disposed of. What you don't do is this. Come to the end of the service and find there are some crumbs on there and go, oh, that'll be good, here we go. So its purpose is simply functional, to gather up the scattered crumbs. Notice also that if it's been ironed and folded properly, it comes in nine, three by three. So the first thing that happens is the corporal. And then on here might be placed the bread and the wine. This is empty at the moment simply for practical reasons. So some bread and some wine. Perhaps a purificator. That's his technical word. His job is simply to clean the chalice. So the purificator goes there. And that is all you need. Sometimes some churches might have little square white boards which you place on top. It's called a pall. Its primary purpose is to keep out insects or falling masonry. I've only ever needed to use a pall to keep out an insect or falling masonry about three or four times in the last nearly 40 years. So if you need one, you might have one to hand, but it's not a necessary element of what you need at the table. So what we're going here for is simplicity and clarity, so that when you can see what's on the table, it helps us to understand what's happening. Now do you notice how I place the pattern of the chalice? This is the pattern. This is actually a bowl, but sometimes we call it a pattern if it's flatter. This is like halfway between one and the other. So, pattern and chalice. Is it like that in your church? Is it like that in any Eucharist you've seen? Is it like that on Sunday when Liz was presiding? Will it be like that tonight when John is presiding? Will it be like that on Saturday when I'm presiding? Or will it be like this? I think that's the most common arrangement that you see in churches and it's very interesting. I think that's done subconsciously and without any thought. It's not deeply theological in intent but it is I believe deeply in theological in terms of what it reveals because I think that shape is the natural shape to have when the table is against the wall. So if you imagine that where you are now, where the camera is, is a wall, it makes sense when the, the whole mood and the drama of the celebration is going down the building, up the chancel steps, through the choir stalls, to the communion rail, 
to the table, to the bread, to the wine, upwards into the rear of us, upwards into the stained glass window, because it's all about everything going to God, and it's all going to the east. So that kind of line makes sense. But when you're gathered around, it doesn't. Because that emphasises that line. This emphasises that line. And I haven't got a chair, because I removed it earlier. But if this was my dining room table and I was having a meal, if I sat down, I wouldn't put my drink like that. I'd put my drink probably like that. So it's there for me to use. My practice on this changed about 25 years ago. I, hadn't, I was in Birmingham at the time. I had an ordinary from Queens, a woman. And she said to me one day, Gary, could you explain to me the things that happened on the table because I wasn't brought up as an Anglican and there's still some things I don't understand. So one day we went into the side chapel and we did exactly what I'm doing with you, but at a distance with the camera, and we looked at what happens on the table. And I did everything I'd done with you, I explained about Don Gregory Dix, I explained about the fourfold action, and I set up the table, and I set it up like that. And I never forget, because I have that kind of memory that recalls the timbre of somebody's voice, and even where they were when they said something. And to this day I remember, she was stood here. And she said to me, Gary, why do you do it like that? And I paused and went, out of habit. It's the way I was taught. And the very fact that she asked me the question, Gary, why do you do it like that? Made me think, why do I do it like that? And from that day onward, I went like that. If you don't believe me about this, you think it's a bit it's a bit weird. Here's a little game you can play, especially during lockdown. Clear the coffee table in your lounge. Give to your your partner or some member of your family a small plate with some food on, and a cup or a mug that's got some tea in, and ask them simply to go and sit down and put the two things on the table in front of them. I am willing to bet. I'm also willing to lose a bet. I'm willing to bet that nobody will do that. But some pe most people will do some variation of that, or that, or that, or perhaps if they're left-handed, that, or that, or that. But not that. And you may think I'm paranoid about this, but I think that line and that arrangement on the table still goes back to that kind of book of common prayer theology of hierarchy and the movement going that way. Because don't, remember, don't forget, when the movement goes that way, the people are behind you. Yes? So the people are here, the priest is here, and the movement goes that way. But when you do it this way, then the movement goes around the table. Okay? This is the last thing that I want to say. For this part until we come to the distribution of communion. If we are being faithful to what the ASB intended and what common worship intended, then we need to make as clear as we possibly can for the people the fourfold action. Another red herring here. By the way, explain the fourfold action to both children and adults is the easiest thing in the world. If you, if you want to do this one day in a sermon, you just say to people, let's play a little game. I'm going to do some things and you tell me what it is I'm doing. And if it's a kind of traditional congregation, you might do something like this. You might go... And eventually somebody will say, you're pulling a pint. Or you might say, what's this? And you go... And they say, oh, you're threading a needle. And then you go, and what does this mean? And I'm willing to bet, if you do it three or four times, and perhaps drop a few hints, eventually somebody will get it. Now my point is, ideally, the whole 
assembly, the congregation, the people should be able to see those four acts very clearly every time there is a community celebration. That means the first one, the taking, has to come by the president before the Eucharistic prayer starts, before he or she says, the Lord is here or the Lord be with you. The, the third one, we're going to come back to the second one, the third one, the breaking of the bread, has to happen clearly after the Lord's Prayer. And then the distribution is done, ideally, not by the President, but by the people, because that emphasises our corporateness and the fact that we are the people of God in Christ and that we are celebrating. But the second one is the hardest, because the second one is doing this. What this means for me, and you, you can disagree with this, and I know some of you will, that's part of the fun of having these kind of discussions. The second one is simply this. This means that in the Eucharistic prayer from, from the beginning, the Lord is here or his spirit is with us, all the way through the Eucharistic prayer, through the sanctus, through the acclamations, right to the end, Amen, the presence shouldn't touch anything. So I'll say that again. From the Lord is here or the Spirit is with us, all the way through that, what we call the proper preface, through the singing or the saying of the sanctus, then through the recalling of the words to the institution, and then the acclamations when we say Christ has died, Christ is risen, and then right to the end, finishing with what we sometimes call the great Amen, which either can be said or sung, the president, he or she, doesn't touch anything. Let you think about that. What tends to happen is this. Here's my copy of Common Worship. I'm putting it next to my candle. I'm in Eucharistic Prayer A. I'm on page 185. This is what you see a lot. Accept our praise, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and blood. Who in the same night he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. And I've seen people break it even at this point. The elderly priest in my village does that. Breaks the bread. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. Yeah? And then, later in the Eucharistic prayer, when we get to the invocation of the Holy Spirit, and in different Eucharistic prayers it comes in different ways, but it might be, send your Holy Spirit. Send your Holy Spirit, so this bread and wine may be for us. That's when you see priests doing this with their hands, and doing this with their hands, and doing that, and that, and that, and that, and all kinds of different peculiar actions. And yet, what I should say is, is that during the whole of the Eucharistic prayer, the person who's presiding, their hands may go up and down as they're doing different things, because classically you have your arms in the air when you're praying for the people, and you put your hands together either like that or like that, or whatever way is comfortable when the people are saying things together. But at no point do you do that. At no point do you do that. So you've got at least three chances to have a look at this this week. You can go back and look at what Liz did on Sunday. You can wait till this evening and see what John does at his table in his home, and you can see what happens on Saturday. You can look at any of the many Eucharists that are being streamed at the moment, and eventually when we get back out of lockdown, you're back to your own parishes or parishes on placement, you can see what your parish priest, what he or she does, does at the table. Do they touch the chalice? Do they touch, do they touch the bread? Does it matter? At one level, it doesn't matter, because... God knows. But at another level, it matters an awful lot. Because our symbols and our words reflect what we mean. And by, by touching the bread at one point, and by touching the wine at one point, we are subconsciously suggesting that something is happening at this moment. And yet, common worship is quite clear, and the Anglican Communion tradition is quite clear, that in the Eucharistic prayer, beginning with the Lord is here, or 
um, the Lord be with you, right through to the end of the Ornen, there is no moment of consecration. There is no moment at which this bread becomes the body of Christ. There is no actual moment at which point this wine becomes for us the blood of Christ, because two things are at play here. The whole of the prayer is consecratory. And secondly, the bread and wine becoming for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ does so not because the priest has consecrated it, which is emphasised by the touching, but because the bread and wine which has become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ has been consecrated by the prayers of the people. Because the Eucharistic prayer is the prayer of the people which is presided over by the person who is presiding. But we all participate in it. We participate with the call and response. We participate with the sanctus. We participate with the acclamations. We participate with the amen at the end. And in some of our Eucharistic prayers now, there are even more responses written in. Because at no, not, not one moment does this become the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the whole, cons the whole prayer, the prayer of the people, is consecratory. And that's what I want to leave you with in terms of this conversation and what I want you to come back at with me in the forums. The idea that if you do do some kind of taking, the irony is, particularly I would, I would challenge here for those of us from a more Protestant or Evangelical tradition, if we begin to touch bread and wine during the Eucharistic prayer, because we think we're kind of reenacting what's happening, the danger is other people will invest that with other meaning. Because I'm pretty confident that those of us from a Protestant or Evangelical tradition would not want to countenance a moment of consecration. And the moment of consecration, by the way, is why in the medieval church they used to have bells. Because you ring the bell at the moment this becomes the body of Christ, and you ring the bell at the moment this becomes the blood of Christ. But if we're trying to get away from that and to follow the fourfold action that Don Gregory Dix has drawn our attention to, then the whole of the Eucharistic prayer is consecrated and there is no moment of consecration. So ask me questions on the forum. And then finally, we're coming to the distribution of communion and I suggest that the bread and wine is taken away. I also suggest that the President receives last. Now, you can't see this in the videos of this week because on Sunday and tonight and on Saturday there's only two, one or two people in the room. But cast your mind back to any All Saints celebration Cast your mind back to what happens in your own churches. At what point does the person who is presiding receive communion? In many churches and traditions, the way the priests were trained and brought up is that they would receive the bread and wine first, they would give it to everybody else. Once again, for me, that emphasises the sense of hierarchy. It goes from priest to assistants to reader to choir to church wards to congregation, etc., etc. But if you were gathered around the table, you would not eat in a hierarchical order, you'd all eat at the same time. Moreover, if one day you are fortunate enough to come to my house and you sit in this dining room with me, you would be a little surprised, I think, if after I put the food down, I said, just wait over there a minute while I sit down and eat my meal first and then invite you to sit down for your meal. I think when you are presiding at the Eucharist, you are also in the position of host. So, in that kind of culture and in that theology, whenever I'm presiding, I always receive the last. Because I think that's what a good host would do. What would you do?